again, hi, I'm JJ. I'm a developer advocate for IBM Cloud, or sorry, IBM Research now, because I'm actually in IBM Research. Um, really do have the email address of awesome at IBM.com. You can find me at JJ Asgard, more or less anywhere. And my goal for this talk, again, as I said a moment ago, is I want you to walk out of this room with some new knowledge. Uh, this stuff is hard. Uh, first of all, I'm giving you permission to, uh, to say that this stuff is confusing and hard. Do not, thank you, <laughs> exactly. It is confusing and hard. I give you that permission. So we're gonna go on a journey together. So who's actually clicked on this link before? All right, well, for the people who are not in the room because everyone raised their hand, I'm gonna click on it anyway. And as you can see here, this is the landscape.cncf.io. It is, how should I say this? Not hyperbole, that if you wanna be successful in the cloud native ecosystem, you have to pretty much know what or, what or how to use a huge portion of those boxes. Now put yourself in, in some new shoes as a, someone who's trying to convince an executive, hey, I need to, I wanna to move to the cloud native space. I have some VMs or I've, I've gotten that, that win. I, we get to use Kubernetes now. And you wanna have this nice little, uh, you wanna move into this because you want the velocity. Of course, your executive hopefully does a little bit of research and they bring up this page. They ask you, hey, so what do I have to do? How do, how, what, are all, what are all these boxes that mean this? And unfortunately, right now, at least in Austin, Texas, where I'm from, to have a, a Kubernetes engineer, to actually have the skill set of everything in, this, everything in this chat, to be confident in, in projects to actually run these things, you are looking at spending $250,000 a year for one engineer, for one cluster. Hang on, you're not gonna need one engineer, one cluster, because who likes working on holidays? Oh wait, I'm in Europe, y'all take holidays all the time compared to me. Oh, that was a, that was a joke, that was a joke. Um, you're gonna need actually at least five, not four, five engineers at 250K a year. How much is that? That's $1.2 million to run one cluster for Kubernetes. And that's not hyperbole, right? When you actually go to the OPEX of running these things, that scares a lot, a lot of CEOs, CTOs, CIOs, whoever you're talking about, because that means they're gonna have to spend a lot of money of people learning how to do that. So with that basis, your boss is probably gonna be like, well, you know what, we're, we've decided to go down this path, let's keep going. So let's actually try to join, let's try to walk through this thing to understand some portions of it. Slideshow. So this is actually, as you can see, um, as of 10, sorry, we're in Europe, so that's uh, Oct January, sorry, October 1st, 2023. As you can tell, I haven't updated this in a while. That was 1,195 cards, which means those are projects, right? It is a significantly higher number now. That is bonkers. So yeah, we're all back in the, uh, the big tent days, and that was one of my jokes later. Thank you very much. I tried to download the image uh, because obviously sometimes I'm not always online when I present. That happened, <laughs> right? That tells you how many of these things are. So I've already kind of gone over this, but I want to reiterate that I want to make sure that you can grasp that this ecosystem actually isn't as hard as that picture assumes. There's a lot of parallels between what we've done in the past and what's happened, and now we're learning that life is just cyclical or life is just a flat circle. So, who actually considers themselves actually cloud native? Like really feel cloud native. All right, get out of this room. You're not gonna, need, you're not gonna learn any of this. You're, you're already done, just fine. This talk is designed to be from people looking into the space and trying to understand what's going on. Because if, you're, if you consider yourself cloud native, you probably have enough 
knowledge in this, or you're probably using EKS or AKS or IKS, because IBM, IKS, anyone? No, okay. Um, again, another joke, no one's laughing, great. Um, they make these choices for you, right? Like you actually don't have to worry about that whole chart because nine out of 10 times that chart's already, cho the, the choice is already chosen for you. So, are we all in data centers right now? Yes, using this thing called VMware that doesn't exist anymore? That was supposed to be another joke, nothing? Yes, data centers? Couple, okay, cool. No OpenStack, no, not yet. <laughs> Again, uh, I wrote this for an American audience. <laughs> so let's talk about some history. So there's a list of free and open source foundations out here, right? Just a good old Wikipedia page. As you can see, these all exist. It's important to recognize that these, are, these all do exist. And we spend a lot of time, obviously, in, in the, in the American, American space, the FSF, the OSI, and, uh, and whatnot all exists. We, I just came from FOSDEM. There was a good representation of um, all the European ones there, which is nice, right? Free, the Free Software Foundation Europe was there, which was good. Um, someone else jumped out at me, but I forget who it is. I should spend more time preparing for this talk. It's fine. But it's important to recognize because the CNCF is not a free, uh, a free, free organization, right? The CNCF actually is a closer to a trade group than it is um, a, uh, a foundation. When you actually look at how it's done and how it's run, um, the, the FSF out there, the uh, the OSI, things like that, they have a, a mission to. Um, uh, to, to do move software forward through a nonprofit. Uh, last time I checked, could be wrong, please don't quote me on this, but last time I checked, uh, the, the LF and the uh, Linux Foundation and the CNCF is not a 50C3, uh, which is a uh, nonprofit in the US. Uh, and it's important to recognize that it's not because it is more of a trade institution than a, uh, that. So if you start putting these things together and recognize that companies like IBM pay for play to get involved in these types of foundations. It's not for, it's not for a nonprofit system, it's for like building the industry up for uh, uh, higher and higher, which is one reason why you see all these different portions of it. So let's talk about the Apache Foundation. The Apache Foundation is, a, is an actual nonprofit. It's a free, free foundation. It's frankly the granddaddy of a lot of the stuff we've been doing. Um, the, who has been involved in the actual Apache Foundation? Anyone? You're lying. Graham, you've got to be lying. No, I'm kidding. Um, it is, it was created uh, around, uh, before obviously uh, HTTPD or Apache Web Server started. It actually started before that. But the interesting part about the Apache Foundation is that it is very, what we would be considered archaic and the way they, they involve themselves. They have multiple different levels of committees. They have multiple different ways of inter interfacing uh, with the community and the way to actually be involved in the space. And it's re important to recognize this because as we go through some of these foundations, there's a constant little uh, uh, iterative progression about learning how to do stuff. And surprisingly, spoiler alert, the CNCF is actually doing it relatively well when you look at all this. And it's important to recognize what they have done on that side to get back to the landscape to understand why it has exploded so largely. But again, the Apache Foundation, it's, it's very archaic compared to everything else. Everything's done through emails and committees. And I actually, some of my cohorts on my team at IBM have been involved in the Apache Foundation for going on 20 years, something like that, which is bonkers when you start thinking about that out loud. Let's talk about open, I mean Open Infra Foundation. So nothing, really, not even a giggle, come on. So yes, yeah, so we don't have OpenStack anymore. Um, it's called the Open Infra Foundation. Uh, it is a, another, th this is kind of a, all the lessons learned of the Apache ecosystem 
and how Apache was ran, you can look at the, how OpenInfra is running themselves now to this day. They still have their conferences, if you didn't know. Um, they were in Vancouver last year. Uh, granted, it's mostly telcos, but that's beside the point. Um, the way they organize and run their system is you can tell has taken from the lessons learned of the wrong word but right word, academic way that um, Apache Foundation does it. They still have their Garrett instance. They still use um, some uh, committees and whatnot to work on it, but it's not so rigid compared to Apache. Apache is very formalized, very X, Y, and Z. But when you look at the way OpenInfra works, as some of the people in this room know, uh, it was actually, as soon as you learned how the right processes were done, it was ripe for abuse. So let's talk about that big tent. <laughs> <laughs> you see that little connection there. The Big Ten was a, it was a mistake, I'm not gonna lie. It was a, it was a mistake for um, the way that OpenStack was trying to stay ahead of the curve at the time. Again, why am I bringing this up about the landscape? It's important to recognize that we've all gone through what was going on in the CNCF already. It's just with different names. The Big Ten was the idea that any project, as long as they fit certain criteria, which was literally like a wiki, a little bit of code, a repo, and one release, not even a release, it was like, like an official release, just like code out there. Oh, and an official meeting time and an IRC channel. Yes, I have a gray beard, leave me alone. Um, you could get that committed and become an open stock, if you will, incubating project. Problem was, there were people out there who discovered there are certain major corporations at this time that would get bonuses <laughs> if you got projects into the big tent. There were people who were actually making legitimate money on the side by getting things pushed into the OpenStax big tent. We're talking thousands upon thousands of dollars. I know some of them. I commend their ability, but they do not work at major corporations anymore, but they still made a good amount of money. So needless to say, back to the, the earlier slide, the way the foundation was set up, the way that things were done, when people were actually incentivized the wrong way, i.e. bonuses, things started getting really messy. So let's go back to the, uh, the website and, and try to understand it a little bit better. So if you looked at it, where did it go? Ah, wrong one. If you look here, there are multiple different big boxes called incubating, graduated, and then, what, really? Go away. Um, all the little ones aren't incubating or graduating. They are, I believe the term is sandbox. Don't quote me on that right now. We're gonna go through it in the slides. But as you can see, there's a lot here, right? Like, I only just showed you the top, <laughs> right? It keeps going, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's scary. What? Oh, here we go. So if you look here, you got the incubating, graduated, and sandbox. This is taken directly from the, one of the uh, presentations from the CNCF. As you can see, the sandbox is um, the important place where play, people can, as long as they go through a little bit of the process, which I'll show you in a second, um, they are, they say, yes, we want to be part of the big, the big tent. Again, big tent's the wrong term, but that's the best way to describe it. We think this is valuable to the Kubernetes ecosystem or the cloud native ecosystem. Okay, I'm just going to say Kubernetes ecosystem because we all know it is actually the Kubernetes ecosystem, right? Which is important to recognize. Then, excuse me for a second. <coughs> then you come along with the, the incubating, which is the, the, the early adopters, right? It's the people who, it's a people a little bit more using the software. It's not just two or three, two, three people who've put together a project, well, that's a lie. Um, to get Sandbox, you actually need a level of governance on top of it, and you have to go through um, an actual committee to get into Sandbox now. And when you're incubating, that is you saying, hey, this actually has a real like 0.5 release, right? 0.5.0 or whatever. Not quite production 0.0.0, 0 
They're getting really close to it. And it's important to recognize that a lot of the, as you can see, that's where the chasm is, or the chasm, sorry. The chasm is, that's where things start dropping off because you're really, really close to getting there, but it's not quite there. When it becomes graduated, that is a moment of celebration. That is basically the CNCF saying, yes, this is a real thing that has real systems involved. As you can see, Helm has graduated, right? Uh, what else? Here we go, Argo CD. These are, these are legitimately production ready that yes, there is a level of, of trust that the industry has around it. There's enough of a governance model around it. There's enough, of, enough people out there are using it. There's, there's enough mind share that says that there are actual experts. Funny thing about like Argo, right? Argo's a great GitOps system, but <laughs> who's ever actually used Argo before? Who's ever used Flux before? What is the biggest difference between Ar Argo and Flux? Humor me, say? The dashboard, exactly. That is exactly where I was going with this. They do the exact same thing, but Argo's really pretty and can show your boss and they actually see what the hell's going on, where Flux is just a bunch of text, right? But as you both see, as you see, they're both graduated, right? There's enough trust around both of them to get the job done. Also, admittedly, Argo is now run, or, uh, Red Hat spends a lot of time in the Argo space. That's a conversation for a beer later. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, but as you can see, right, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole scale of stuff here. The, um, one of the more interesting ones here is the uh, operator framework, which is the uh, incubating. Now, so again, what is incubating, right? Incubating is right here. It's right before the, the, the chasm. Who knows what the operator framework actually does? Got a couple, okay. The operator framework is a really, uh, it's a, for lack of a better term, a template of either Go or Ansible to be able to create a new operator for uh, the way you can do stuff inside of Kubernetes. Who knows actually what an operator is? Okay, so there's enough hands in there that I don't have to explain. But for who doesn't know, an operator is uh, a PKG or an MSI file for Kubernetes. Right, you install the operator and then you double click, if you will, on it and it spits out the software you're looking for and you can put like the auto updates and shit like that inside of it. But the point is, is the operator framework is a, a template to be able to create all that logic for you inside of it, which is really, really powerful. What did I just say? I'm telling you that the way you install software on a Kubernetes cluster is incubating but we have Argo CD or Flux CD, which is, which is uh, uh, CI, or sorry, um, GitOps, that is already graduated. It's, there's a different path to each of these projects. But anyway, you get the point. And then after it's graduated, uh, it starts turning into, you know, it, that's where the rest of the system goes. You get the point. So this is, the, this is actually taken from the actual process where you start in the sandbox, as I was saying earlier, it goes through a couple conversations, goes through a couple PRs, and then you get to incubation, and then you get to graduation. This is taken directly from the uh, CNCF process. Um, this is actually in their documentation, but you get it. Um, the important part is, is just like the, the just like the big tent we had in OpenStack, the sandbox really is the place to see if it's worth it or not to come in, and then incubation is when people are really starting to use it. And here's the full flow uh, when you want to actually put the process in. Now, this looks like a lot, but watch, just start at the beginning and just follow it along. It's like two PRs, and then you can get a uh, project to be in part of the sandbox, which is kind of nice. This, uh, this uh, TOC sandbox review progression decision is uh, surprisingly quick, which is really neat. Um, there's enough people involved in this ecosystem that uh, things really do come around quickly. So this is, what, this is a much more in-depth process when it becomes incubation. The SIG reputation, who knows what a SIG is? Who do, a better question, who does not know what a SIG is? That is a special interest group. It is a bunch of peers who um, 
are involved at some level, uh, level inside of the project who represent the governance for the project. So it's like a subgroup of the group. And uh, there's SIGs for all different things. Um, there's anything ranging from the, the meme SIG uh, of like SIG boba to like SIG networking, right? Uh, I'm a type 1 diabetic, so we have a SIG diabetes, just as a, you know, it's a special interest group. I have interests inside of, obviously, diabetes. Supposed to be a joke, nobody laughed. Awesome. Um, but you get the point. The, when you're starting to get the, the project closer to incubation, the SIG starts forming, things come together, and then the, the process of due diligence to make sure that people actually are working together. As you can see through this chart, it, I'm not going to read the whole thing, you get the point. But then incubation happens. When incubation really happens, that is another celebratory system uh, spot inside of the process of becoming a project inside of the CNCF, or sorry, inside of the, the landscape. That is a, again, a celebration. Take a look at it. Again, build packs is incubate, uh, incubating, right? Open framework. It's, it is a major milestone. If you see it there, it is, I cannot stress enough, this is a big, big deal. I just realized that. Uh, Linker D and SGO are both graduating. I didn't realize that. Huh. Oops, that's the wrong one. <coughs> so the graduation process, we've already kind of gone through. It's a much bigger deal. And uh, there was no pretty diagram because it is much more involved, right? There's a lot of different sign-offs and whatnot. What happened? But hopefully you've understood at least in the conversation we've had. This is, uh, again, an old diagram. This is the best I could find. As you can see, uh, what is the most interesting number on, on that chart? Who, anyone? Archive, yes. There's only, we've had a progression, significant progression here, but only two projects archives. What does that tell you about the landscape? That's not Google, that's funny, that's very funny. But no, seriously, to follow up, what, what, what do you think that means? Expected. I'm sorry? Expected. It's active, okay, it's a good way of putting it. But I know of a lot of projects out there that ha exist, but I haven't touched in two and a half years. Do you consider that, should that still be around part of the environment? Especially in an uh, ecosystem that moves so quickly as cloud native? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, sure, go ahead. They're not very self-critical. That's another way of putting it. You, you are both correct, right? The idea is that there's not really a clear place for offboarding. Uh, even though it might be sticking around for a little while, like Flux CD from what I last time I checked, hasn't changed much, right? It's very stable, it does exactly what you expect it to do. It's not, not frankly, it's not sexy by any standard, but it doesn't change much but it's not self-critical because it has graduated and got through, right? So when do you archive that project? Exactly, nobody wants to be the mean guy, which is a good, important thing to recognize as you are looking at the landscape to figure out what things you need to do. That's hopefully I got that point across. So let's look at some of those graduated projects to make sure we all at least see them. These are them here. Uh, these all should be recognizable. As if you've touched the uh, cloud native space at all, all of these should at least stick out to you. Are there any of the ones that people do not recognize? You mean safe space, you can admit it. About half of them, which one doesn't jump out? Which one are you having trouble with? Uh, Kubernetes, it is a scheduler. <laughs> Rook. Okay, so let's, let's take Rook. Um, Rook is a, is a, uh, uh, a storage platform um, based off of Ceph, believe it or not. Um, and it is, uh, it's just basic, it's, it's a storage system that actually work, or works quite well inside of the, the cloud native ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of people around it that do some really cool stuff. And uh, obviously Red Hat and I have a good relationship now. And uh, I, I know they are doing awesome things. What was another one? Anyone else? Yes. Yes. So. Uh, 
Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so um, just to, to reiterate for the, 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 the um, recording, um, pointing out the database is an obvious kind of question. Like you see Postgres and you see MySQL or MariaDB or whatever in the landscape, but they're not graduated, right? Or at least when I made these slides, they're not graduated. But we have TKV and V Vitness or v v whatever, um, graduated, yeah. They are designed to be cloud native, right? They're designed to actually fit in the space of, of how Kubernetes works compared to something like Postgres or MariaDB, which they are trying to retrofit the way a Kubernetes cluster works um, with the scheduling and the way it, it, the, the traditional VM does not work in the space that was written for it. Hence the reason why something like these two have, have succeeded. Sorry. Of course, as soon as you start talking, your throat goes dry, right? I don't know if, I didn't really answer your question there though, but the point being is that they're just cloud native, cloud native databases. And because they've gone through this whole process to become graduated, if you are choosing a, if you need to run a database on Kubernetes, we should have a deeper conversation about why you're doing that. But if you are going down that path, these are two that you should actually take a serious consideration for, right? Yes, I still don't believe you should run a database on Kubernetes. Come at me. All right. So this is an old slide, but this was when I made it, um, when I made this deck, the, this deck, obviously these are, this was back in, uh, I think the first time I made this deck was, and I haven't updated it because I'm lazy, uh, October. As you can see, operator framework is still there, right? It's important to recognize that. This does not happen quickly. There is a whole process to become graduated. Even though there are multiple companies that I know of have created operators from the operator framework because my team at IBM does that, um, they spend a lot of money there, but it is still not graduated because they still haven't gone through the process, right? Um, Knative is an interesting one. Everyone knows what Knative is, right? Who, who does not know what Knative is? Good, okay, cool. That's interesting, it still has not graduated, right? The way to run serverless functions on your Kubernetes cluster um, is still debated on how to do, be done, which is, which is an interesting thing. It's good to recognize that. So, <laughs> Hopefully this actually, hopefully you already have an answer for this, but it's true, right? When you start going to the, the cloud native ecosystem and start choosing portion portions of Kubernetes, you have to know what all these different parts are that goes back to those engineers at the very beginning. You hire all these people who have the exper expertise to understand how to do this stuff. And it's challenging to recognize all these different pieces and what they do. I mean, back to your statement about da databases, right? Like, if, are you, do you want to put your business on someone who's gonna run Postgres on Kubernetes? I don't know, let's have some beers and have that conversation, right? But it's important to recognize if your business relies on this, if they didn't know about those database, natural databases for your cloud native space, they have to worry about that. So <laughs> this is the hardest question because your executive is gonna come back and ask you, well, why did we choose Calico to do the thing, right? Why did we choose to do this thing? And how will you know if you chose the wrong project? That's the fun part. You, you, you don't. <laughs> you, you have no idea if you choose whatever project you've chosen to do the build your business off of. You, you, you're not going to get to. You're not going to. You're not going to know. Now. If you go to, if you decide to run Kubernetes through a third party like uh, AKS or EKS or IKS, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you get to a small portion to be able to switch things out, switch, uh, switch different portions of Kubernetes out or the ecosystem out to do stuff. But there are products out there too that are full encompassing things. I'm not gonna sell that to you, but if you wanna know, please come find me. 
because then now you can just think about running your software on Kubernetes instead of having to deal with this whole ecosystem. So where do you go from here? Hopefully we have a, a little bit deeper conversation after I finish these slides because hopefully somebody has a question about one of these projects because that's the goal, right? There are probably some projects out there that you're just like, I have no idea if this is even useful. I'm trying to play around with it. And let's have that little conversation. And hopefully it's given you enough knowledge to understand that there is a cycle to all these projects compared to just being in the big tent and then being part of the ecosystem. There's, there's an understanding for the engineers that are involved in this ecosystem and how much effort and all to, to work from there. So hopefully that's gotten you, hopefully you come to there. <laughs> I forgot to put that in there. Um, yes, OpenShift is a way to bypass all this conversation, right? Where you have uh, a Kubernetes cluster that is enterprise ready that Red Hat supports. And it's important to recognize that. The, the choices are here are hard. And if you want to spend that much money on engineers to make these happen, by God, you know, we need more engineers to do this stuff. But if you're talking to your business owners and they are looking to just get software out there so they can make their, sides, their lives easier, OpenShift is probably the path to go. And yes, this stuff is hard. It's, I, I cannot stress enough, this stuff is hard and it's very confusing and it changes daily. It really does. And that's a very weird place to be in, your indus in our industry. Thank you. So questions, projects, anything? Yes. So when I'm in the last stage of my project, right? So I'm done, I have to check more, I, I have star. Yeah. Use. What, is, what do I have to adhere to to teach it then? Or is it just I get it one time and then? That goes back to this slide right here. The question was, I got in, I got my thing sandboxed. Hell, I might have even gotten incubated, right? Graduated? Yeah, you might be done, well, done. The, the thing is though, um, part of the process of getting up in the actual uh, incubation and graduated after sandbox is a deployment, uh, development plan. Because there's enough people involved in the project to get across that chasm, or chasm, however you wanna say it, um, there's enough people involved in that space the idea is that it's gonna be self-fulfilling, right? It's not just gonna be done. There's gonna be enough people walk, looking at it. There's gonna be reviews. There's gonna be um, CVE checks and all that. There's, there's enough governance around it to make sure that it continues. So it's never really done. But sandbox on the other hand, yeah, you can get that sandbox in there. And then again, we only have two things, back, back in, that was over a year ago now. There's only two archived at that time because nobody wanted to archive their stuff. They could just let it sit there because sandbox, as you can see, is the majority of them are just sitting there. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Not necessarily, right? Because the only time you can be done and like walk away from the project is the idea that you're in the sandbox phase. Right, where you're just playing around trying to see if it works, see if it's good. If you get to incubating and obviously graduated, there's enough governance around it and enough system that the CNCF has acknowledged that you have not just you doing it, right? There's, there's a SIG involved. There's probably interdependencies with other projects. There's enough of a conversation that the project will continue moving forward, that there is never a done situation at that point. Though if you created something fun inside of the sandbox that Hello World or whatever, right, that obviously Hello World's a bad example, but it just does one thing and one thing only, that's when it'll stay probably in the sandbox price and it'll never get farther because there's not money anywhere else to go. From what I understand, no. From what I understand, there is not. Uh, because that's the reason why 
that we only have two archive projects right there. There's not like an a, a auditing system, I think is what you're asking for. From what I understand, uh, the last time I read through this whole process, there is not actually an audit way because the idea is you're constantly moving forward. Um, if that answers your question. There was? Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, no, th uh, three of the four of the maintainers were all on my team at IBM. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a different conversation. <laughs> But it, but it took like six months, right? Like it was a whole, yeah. The, to, to reiterate for the, uh, the, the recording, uh, Graham was pointing out that um, etcd had a problem with maintainership, that uh, they put a, the TOC brought out a request for um, people to come into etcd to boost the, 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 the amount of people involved. But it took six, eight months of that to, to actually be effective, which is not great. <laughs> <laughs> Not great at all. Other questions? Thoughts? Nothing? Whole point is a conversation, people. I mean, I can just put this back up here and, you know, you can take a picture of it or, hell, you can just go to the website and show it to your boss and be like, I'm an expert in all this stuff now. Give me a lot of money. No? And think, hey, you smiled. That was good. That's what I needed. Look, there's DB2 here. <laughs> so... Yeah, as you can see, my, my, my last time, oh, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, as you saw in my previous slide, uh, previous slide that uh, Cilium had not graduated yet, and now it is. But uh, who, who owns the company that m created Cilium now? Cisco. Yeah, um, Isovalent got bought by Cisco. So that's a good conversation to have with your business, right? Uh, the way, if you don't know what CLEM does, it's the EBBF Networking Security and Observability. Um, I have my personal opinions and I'm going to say them right now. Uh, EBPF is basically giving root to all of your network traffic, <laughs> right? If you, go, if you look at it, it at a very sysadmin level, EBPF is giving root to everything. That means Cisco now owns <laughs> the software uh, that gives you root to all of your systems. Uh, so that's a very large conversation with you if you have a uh, regulated environment uh, of what they could see down the line. So keep your eye on that one. Ah, so so your, your, your statement was, just to make sure people heard it, that's the same story with IBM, OpenShift, OpenStack, and the way that works. That is valid. Um, Open, OpenShift... Uh, has, when you buy OpenShift from IBM or Red Hat, you do get SREs that have uh, admin access to everything. That's a conversation you need to have with your business because those SREs um, that have access to your system, um, they, they, they offset the need for that $1.2 million uh, OPEX of humans. If you want to bring this stuff inside, you can absolutely run OpenShift inside your, your data center and not have IBM have access at all inside your own data center. So I should have done the hand, should have done the hand one, because of course I decided to have to cough. But if you decide to buy it through them and run it on a, uh, uh, Azure, Google, AWS, IBM, of course, there's going to be SREs to do that to help run it. And that's going to be after conversation you have to have with your business to understand which one's better. This one, on the other hand, if you just have eBPF because you need real-time monitoring on stuff, right? There's a conversation you need to have with your business there because eBPF opens the doors in a lot of ways that a lot of people who don't spend their time on that space understand the risks that can be there. Did I answer your question? Exactly. It's, it's a very weird, it, again, it, there, things work in a really weird, weird system, right? Like, like Linkerd and Istio have graduated, right? Do we talk about service meshes anymore? Because no, they're really fucking hard to run, right? So, go ahead, I'm sorry.
Yeah. 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 So, uh, 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 the, to reiterate the question is, first of all, does the CNCF endorse these things? And what are the requirements? Well, I'm not going to tell you all the requirements because that would put us all to sleep. Um, but you can easily Google them and find them. But that one's on there, right? That is never going to be open source, right? Um, there's a lot of business right there, and that will never, ever be, on, uh, be open source. So that answers that question. And the next part of it is, is, is this a stamp of approval from the CNCF, right? Is this a stamp of approval from from the organization? And the answer is, in my opinion, I, if I'm wrong, please tell me I'm wrong, right? I want to know. My opinion is no. Because what is the CNCF is? What is it? It is a foundation, back to the original statement of all the different foundations out there, of all the lessons learned that we've had in the previous foundations to create a trade, industry, trade group that moves all of the stuff we need to forward. They are just creating the governance model to make sure that they are successful. And back to the joke earlier, right? You don't know. That's the fun part. You don't, right? Like, you have no idea what you're going to choose, if it's going to be successful or not. And that's why these cottage versions of Kubernetes or enterprise-grade Kubernetes are coming out. Because now you don't have to spend the time and effort with all these different engineers, which, don't get me wrong, if you want to be one of them, you can make a lot of money. Absolutely. But, you know, I let, I'm a 40-year-old man. I got two kids. I like to sleep at 3 in the morning, right? <laughs> like, I like that. You might not. Go for it, buddy. But, like, when I start talking to enterprises about these things, it's a real factor, right? It's not, it's not all just, like, unicorns and rainbows here. This, we've, our industry has grown so much. Our, the, the landscape has grown so much. You need to now understand what you're choosing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You. Yep. Exactly. You 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 feel more confident that it will work in the system you're looking for. Challenge is, though, you should probably have a larger conversation about why you've decided to run a cloud-native-based database, right? Like, why, why, yeah, but that, that opens up a whole other conversation with your devs team about how they're doing the database stuff, right? And that opens up, like, in the DevOps mentality of breaking down silos, it comes into this place, too, because all of a sudden you're not choosing, like, when you choose, you don't come up here and choose it from a, a menu, right? You never come to the landscape and be like, you know what? I think this week we're going to do everything with Purell, Jenkins, uh, Neo4j, and I don't even know this downstream thing. Let's have some fun, right? You're not going to do it that way, right? You're going to, you're going to build it how your developers expect to have it. But when your developer decides to choose downstream.io, which, I mean, I'll never be as cool as that octopus, right? Um, you can be like, well, hey, hey, homeboys, like, I've never heard of this. Why are we choosing it? We have cloud events that we know for a fact work. Like, it works in the system we're trying to build. Give me a reason why we chose downstream events, right? Hopefully, the, hopefully this conversation you've given, you understand you have that power now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. No. Uh, no questions. Let's say I'm completely new to any of this. Okay. This is uh, extremely overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, I don't have uh, two years to go and look at every project. What, uh, what do you recommend? Uh, 
Okay. The question is, is I'm brand new to this. I don't have two years of my life to waste learning all this stuff. What do I do? You go back to your business and say, what are we actually trying to do? Honestly, ask them, do we need to run, first of all, do we need to run Kubernetes, <laughs> right? There's a, I mean, again, I'm using Kubernetes as a catch-all system. It could be cloud native, whatever, but first question you gotta ask them is, do we actually need to do it this way? Like, why are we doing it this way? If, it's, if our app is, hey, you never know, right? But if you have someone who comes back to you and says, you know what, I just have this container we gotta run that runs some little Flask app that is an API that we need to do. Okay, like, do we really need to spin up a three node cluster of Kubernetes running Calico on it? Like, that, that's a whole nother conversation. With that, if they ever do say yes, we actually do need to because we need to run Kubernetes in our own data center because we hate ourselves and we have to make these choices. Again, don't, don't run Kubernetes by yourself. There you go, I love it. Use, buy VMware, use OpenShift, there he goes. We're, oh, Cote left the room, oh, he would have been happy with that one. Um, Donnie liked it though. Uh, <laughs> um, in all seriousness, start with, the, start with the graduated projects, right? Start with, see the different portions and where the different portions fit. And if you have, you don't have two years to understand this all, you don't need to understand them all, right? You just need to understand what the different portions do. Once again, going back to the Flux and Argo CD conversation, where you understand the power of Argo CD to tell your manager, hey, this is cool graph fun stuff, but it turns out we actually just need Flux CD because we just gotta make sure this container is only version two, and I change one YAML, it turns to version three, right? That is, that is the power of it. You, you start at the graduated projects to understand what they do, and then you just kind of work down when you find a problem with that graduated project and move forward from there. That is a good question. That is a great question. I don't have a good answer for you on that one. Um, the question was, is there a requirement for it to be interoperable? And Graham says no, and I trust Graham completely. So Graham says no. Hey! <laughs> I hear there's some great uh, uh, educational providers out there that can teach me the answers to these questions. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we are close to time. We've got 10 more minutes. Okay, uh, I'm done. We can keep having this conversation. Uh, I, I can do a jig. No? Dance? No. Yeah. Yo! What is the status of the IDF database? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, by, yeah, excellent question. That's in the sandbox. Yes. So it's not but this goes back to the trade group conversation. What does it say right there? Yeah, it's a bot spot. It's a spot. It's a platinum member. This makes sure that IBM is a member of the CNCF. We have a product, or project, project, sorry, not product, project, inside the landscape.cncf that is in the sandbox to say that we, are, we, have, we can be by ourselves into this, right? It, it's all completely transparent. You look through the rules, you, to be a platinum member, we used to be higher than that, I thought we were a diamond member. Point being, um, <laughs> I work for a small company, leave me alone. Um, you have to have enough presence inside the, the thing, so we are just part of the sandbox. That's as far, we don't want to go farther than that but it allows us to say that we're part of the database ecosystem of the, the, the landscape. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yep. So if we played uh, where else is uh, IBM on here, we might be able to find them. This is an interesting one here. DQIQ, does everyone remember who that is? Mesosphere, yeah. Yeah, they lost that war. But they're here with the continuous delivery and integration, which if you really think about it, that's kind of what they were trying to do. But again, 
they were trying to be the data center operating system. So, cool. Any other thoughts, questions? No? Well, thank you all for coming. <laughs>